Experts called it a thousand year flood. That's a once in a thousand year event, right? Wrong. Ellicott City, Maryland, May 2018. All this damage, all these lost buildings had just recovered from another thousand year flood only 22 months earlier. They're still, even today, removing debris from these buildings. This is how Ellicott City is fighting the floods. Years before the Revolutionary War, Ellicott City was already founded. The width of this street hasn't changed very much at all. It's mills humming with activity, powered by the waters that would flow downstream towards the center of town. Old Ellicott City's topography worked perfectly to push water towards its center, but conditions have changed in the last 250 years. We have more intense and more frequent storms, and we can't have a plan that focuses on what can be done fast, but what can be done best. Two major American cities, D.C. and Baltimore, have emerged around this historic town, yet the narrow horse and buggy streets and stone buildings still exist here in modern times. So we're walking on top of water right now. That's correct. On this water, crosswalk. Water is running under here as we speak. Deputy Director of Public Works Mark Dillica took us through the latest plan to make this city safer when the next flood comes. It would require a reimagining of the city built more than a century ago. This is the exact spot where a flash flood can go from bad to worse, where the Tiber and new cut streams combine. Not only are you adding more water here, but you're pushing it through a tighter spot almost as if someone took two fire hoses and tried to push that energy through a garden hose. This is what's left of Kaplan's department store. Decades ago, someone put it on a bridge over the water. This is the original building yeah. that might date back to the 18 or 1700s. And then this uh, is a new addition that was put across the, the, uh, the river. Was that a good idea to do? I think at the time, People thought so, I don't know. Four buildings will still likely have to come down just for safety purposes. Howard County Executive Dr. Calvin Ball is looking to spend somewhere between 113 and 140 million dollars to redirect the water flow. And we're not talking about your typical road work here. So this is the area where we were talking about a tunnel. Two tunnels bored through what may be solid rock will move the water underneath Ellicott City and not through its streets. I know that there are some who think that it can't be done, but I think that we are only held captive by the limitations of our imagination and our innovation of the technology. They've already put up new signs and sirens, but we found one business owner who's not waiting for the government to step in. So let me show you how I fixed it. Oh. Randy Mariner jacked up his restaurant, raising it 18 inches off the ground. We poured a concrete sidewalk to act as a storm gutter. We're here on the outside terrace. When it rains here, we put grates in here so when the rain falls, it has a place to go as well. And it goes through that wall and there's a big pipe. By the time the 2018 flood hit, the half million dollar system worked and his business was saved. Unfortunately, in the flood last year, there was one fatality and that was our employee. Eddie Hermond, a restaurant manager, was also in the National Guard. When the waters came, he saw somebody in danger and was trying to help her and got caught up in the flood waters. Didn't make it. So, I can fix buildings. I can't fix that. It's not inexpensive. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to be paid for. Um, but it would be a, a, a tragedy to do nothing. Eight years before Hurricane Katrina, the largest evacuation of an American town happened in the cities of Grand Forks, North Dakota and East Grand Forks, Minnesota. Usually divided by the Red River of the North, these two cities were flooded together as one major disaster. 50,000 people left their homes behind as downtown began to flood and eventually burn as well. While other cities have flooded, while other cities have drawn up expensive plans 
plans to prevent future disasters. We found some cities that are not messing around when it comes to flood protection using every tool possible. This giant pump is one way Grand Forks is successfully fighting the floods. They knew the water was coming back in April of 1997. They had seen it before. The river was really starting to come up fast. Grand Forks Herald reporter Brad Doken watched as the flood blocked access to his town. At the same time, a small fire started, and since fire trucks couldn't get in there, it quickly turned into an inferno that raged through 11 downtown buildings. The newspaper never stopped, and uh, they actually stopped the press in mid-run that Friday night. The presses only stopped, as you see here, because the flood started expanding the paper stock, smearing the ink, and shutting down the printers themselves in the early morning hours. But by late afternoon, the presses started up again on a backup machine 277 miles away in St. Paul, Minnesota. You know, people are dealing with trying to get a paper out, but at the same time trying to keep their homes safe. Deep in the newspaper's basement, there is a box of photographs and first-hand accounts. This strong-willed newsroom refused to stop. The flood and fire may be old news today, but this story made the people of Grand Forks do something. This is Lincoln Drive neighborhood. Yep. That's the green space area now. Yep, yep. And it, you know, it, it blew the house right off the foundation. They made the controversial decision to sacrifice an entire Riverside neighborhood called Lincoln Park. It was just too close to the river for families to safely live there anymore. When you look at it like this, it looks like a beautifully treed arbor park. Bulldozers leveled 350 homes in an area that's now 20 miles of green space trails. So we're stopping right now, you can see. Look down. Oh wow! Even oh, yeah, yeah. It's a street. Yeah, I guess right? so. You you could you could imagine that that's a street going down there. This site right here is actually the location of where the elementary school, Lincoln Elementary School, was. In fact, the flagpole still stands here as a monument to the school and to the neighborhood. Turning a neighborhood into a park was only the first step. The cities didn't want this to happen again, so they improved the earthen levees. They put up removable flood walls on both the North Dakota and Minnesota sides of the river. Oh my goodness, I didn't expect that to go down that far. And they built 12 pumping stations, the largest one with four giant pumps. It's supposed to pump 28,000 gallons a minute per pump. So it's over 100,000 gallons a minute. You've been mayor for 19, 19 years? 19 years, one month. That's just about as long as it's been since the flood that prompted the largest evacuation of a town since the Civil War. The evacuation saved lives. Not one person died in the flood and fire. FEMA has referred to us as the poster child of recovery because we took the assistance and we made it work. Nearly half a billion dollars came from the federal government. In fact, that's President Clinton in a helicopter over the 54-foot floodwaters. It's really hard to wrap your head around just how much water we're talking about here on the banks of the Red River until you take the camera and go all the way up to the top of the 1997 water line. The U.S. Geological Survey has records dating back to the mid-1700s in this area, and that 1997 flood, well, that one is by far the worst. Since the upgrades, there have been many floods, but this system has worked. The water is now held back by river diversions, 120-inch diameter pipes, and a strong survival instinct. Just like that stopped newspaper press, Grand Forks found a way to keep running. Well, nobody else but local newspapers can really bring it home. I mean, they, they know the area, they know the people. We wanted normal again, and we got it. We got better than normal. Hurricane Harvey roared towards the Texas coast in 2017, found Houston, and simply stopped there. For more than two days, the storm dumped unprecedented amounts of rain on the metro area. I was shocked at what I was seeing on the radar. I, I could not believe that the, the rain bands just kept moving in and kept landing on exactly 
the same areas. We are live in a Black Hawk helicopter over Texas. I spent the next few days in a helicopter as first responders rescued soaked grandmothers and grandfathers from their rooftops right outside town. This is the story of how the fourth most populated city in the country dried out and improved the massive flood control system that would help prevent another Harvey. This is how Houston is fighting the flood. This is Houston today. Well, we're walking along the banks of Bray's Bayou in, uh, in Houston in Harris County, Texas. Matt Zeeb from the Flood Control District in Houston's Harris County walked us down a bayou, one of those winding, slow-moving waterways in this flat city. Houston's government is using what nature put here and enhancing it. This particular segment of the project's been going on since last summer, last August. The county is now widening and upgrading these 20 miles of bayous and adding concrete sides, and in some cases, large walls. We have completed work both directions, but the most of it's this way, and it's very dramatic. You can easily see all the work we've done, the retaining walls. There are hundreds of proposals on 22 different watersheds. Rice University environmental engineer Dr. Phil Bedian tells us U.S. cities like Houston need a larger solution, widening waterways, digging holes to store the water, and buying dangerous flood-prone areas where homes once stood. The floods seem to be getting bigger and more frequent. Some problems can't be fixed at all. There's just millions more people here now that are affected by it. The building is fast and furious. Houston's very growth has put more people at risk. Millions of people in a very large area, that's right. About 2.3 million people live in the city of Houston today. But back when they first upgraded the concrete back in the 1960s, the population was less than a million. And it does not take a hurricane to flood this area. These floods have a devastating and long lasting effect, like right over my shoulder. Just a few hours ago, crews started demolishing this abandoned house in Spring, Texas. The flood here happened in 2016. This was the result of a heavy rainfall north of town. Drive around today, and this neighborhood is still recovering, more than two years on. The past few years, we've just been hit with some really, really devastating floods back to back to back. These multi-million dollar flood upgrades are sometimes paid by local taxes. Other times, they split the cost with the federal government. They are also redrawing the flood maps for everyone who lives here. If they're currently not in a flood zone, but our new mapping shows that they are in a flood zone, then their premiums may go up. Meaning higher flood insurance rates for thousands in Harris County, Texas. When the next storm comes, and it will, raindrops will fall on a new Houston, a more high-tech place, where in some cases, internet-connected flood detection systems will trigger everyone's phone. So now the road network is completely contained in a computer model. The pilot program instantly shows flooded out roads, helping Houstonians get to safety faster. And so all we're doing is we're using the power of Google Maps combined with the power of our flood warning system and we've married the two together. 